Amazing. Let's start. Let's start. Yep. All right. Ready for me? All right, I'm ready to go. Ready? Okay. Okay. Where is it? Oh, okay. So if I'm in this section, it's good? Okay. Okay, perfect. Good evening, everyone. Check, check. Okay. And we're live. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Woo. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Welcome, welcome. Thank you all so much for being here. Those of you who are in person, welcome to 303's Wacker. Some of you have been here before. Some of you, this is your first time. And we're so excited to be using this space this evening. Those of you who are online, welcome. We are so happy to have you as well. Um, we have a great program for you tonight, um, and we're really excited to go ahead and get started. So I've got a couple quick words that I want to share um, as a quick welcome, and then we'll go ahead and get started. So first off, I have a question for everyone. How do you get people to notice you online? This is an IMC question. You really have to make an impression. Get it now? Okay. What's the safest place to hide a dead body? You should know this one. Second page of Google, right? <laughs> Digital marketing strategy, you guys know those. Okay, but I'm bunch. I'm here all night. No, I'm just kidding. I'm not, thankfully. Um, so my name is Kelly Cutler. Hi, welcome. Please join us. Um, I'm the program director for IMC Professional, and I'm also a faculty member. I've had many of you in my classes, and I have some of you in my class right now. So welcome, everyone. We are just so excited to kick things off this evening. Um, I wanted to um, just give you a quick introduction to our panelists and our keynote speaker before we go ahead and get started. So our keynote speaker is Amy Thorne. And we are so lucky to have Amy. She is an industry leader and she's the executive vice president and chief creative officer at Merkel. And she's going to provide us with a short, uh, but very engaging and interesting keynote address. Um, and then after that, we will be followed by our wonderful panel this evening. And our panel includes Lisa Evia from Havas, who is actually an IMC graduate, 2005, very exciting. One fact about Lisa, she didn't remember when she graduated from the IMC program, so I looked it up for her. We're happy to have you. <laughs> Steve Moffat from Guaranteed Rate is here to join us this evening. Karna Crawford flew all the way in from New Jersey, and she is from Ford, is here with us this evening. Welcome, Karna. And last but certainly not least, coming all the way from the West Loop is Dave Tan from Google. And of course, we also have Amy Thorne from Merkel. So in true IMC spirit, Amy is a passionate leader in the digital and marketing space. Um, she's passionate about building meaningful customer relationships, which is obviously important to all of us in the IMC program as well. Um, however, possibly the most impressive thing about Amy is her desire to share and to give back which is really part of why she's here this evening, and we're very lucky to have her. Amy's dedicated to ongoing growth and learning initiatives, as well as diversity and inclusion through her participation in the diversity and inclusion group at Merkel as an executive sponsor, women in leadership sponsor, and through the Female Foundry. With that, please join me in a very warm welcome for Amy Thorne and our panel of experts. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Hope so. Yeah. All right, good. Uh, well, I'll be honest with you guys. This is the first uh, big group in person that I've, I've spoken to, right? You know, there used to be some, there used to be some um, 
oh, there used to be some ballrooms that we might have to fill and talk through and, you know, lots of faces, but I'm really excited to be here tonight, um, regardless of maybe, you know, some of my nerves today and having to get in front of all of you today. Um, in talking to Kelly um, about this event, I thought one, you guys should get a perspective of kind of where I sit in the Dentsu universe. Um, so that's first and foremost, we've covered that. Um, but I really think that as we think about the client V agency, I use V uh, versus and or, um, but as we think about that, I think it's really important to kind of take a step back and, and really give you some perspective in terms of kind of how I think about agencies, agency life. It's really the one area that I've known um, I've dabbled very little on the client side. Um, and so if we want to go ahead and, and, and take a look at kind of what I mean by that, um, I really think of us being in the business of service. And what that really means is um, going back and thinking through, you know, service as a way to engage clients, uh, a way to lead people. Um, because as managers, that's where we find ourselves serving others um, who might be reporting up to us. Um, the business of service for me started a long time ago. I'm from the north woods of Wisconsin. And if anybody's been up to Eagle River, Manaqua, um, or anybody who has ever been in the restaurant business, um, I think that's really where a lot of this idea of service started, kind of started for me. I took my first dishwashing job at the Pub and Prime. As you can imagine, it was a classy place. And I was a dishwasher, I needed a job. I realized six days later, I was not a good dishwasher. So I really wanted to be a bus girl. Um, really thinking about getting out of the kitchen and in front of customers was a big opportunity for me. So I said, guys, could I be a bus girl instead of a dishwasher? And they said, sure, rest of the summer, I was a dishwasher there. Next summer, I went to a different place to, to wash, to, uh, excuse me, to bus tables. Um, I went to the Musty Inn and there I learned a very different dynamic. Um, that dynamic was one of long-term relationships. Um, everybody there was kind of like family, even though they weren't related. The woman who ran the restaurant, it was a, it was a big, it was a big German restaurant actually in the North Woods of Wisconsin. And we, at the end of the day, felt very familial, even though we weren't. She had long-term relationships with her staff, um, really 10 plus years, which is a long time in the restaurant world. It's also a long time in the agency world to have a lot of those relationships. Um, her chef had been there forever. Everybody knew each other and they were great friends. So I was there, it was a really great time to be in serving with them, alongside them, right? But I really wanted to be a waitress. I really did because that's where all the money was <laughs> and I got to be in front of customers more often than not and I thought uh lo and behold I actually thought that I wouldn't have to do any more cleanup I wasn't going to have to do any of that stuff um but the reality was is that um Muskie Inn didn't have a spot for me so I went to Clearview Supper Club the following year and that was actually all family owned Gloria was the matriarch of the family. She also was the hostess with the mostess and she ran a tight ship. And I knew her granddaughter. Her granddaughter said, how about coming and meeting my grandmother and we'll see if we can get you a waitress job. I was 16, you had to be 18 to wait tables and serve alcohol. So I went in not knowing if she was gonna give me the job and, and Gloria said, well, I hear you wanna be a waitress. I said, I do, I really wanna be a waitress. She's like, okay. She's like, how old are you? And I said, well, I'm 16. She said, well, you look 18 to me. And I said, that's great. And she said, you've got a job. So you get to start being a waitress here at Cleaver Supper Club. And the money was great, but it was truly a family dynamic. She ran the front of the house. Her husband, Frank, who was a salty old Navy guy, was the bartender. And you could rely on Frank for a couple of things. You could rely on him for giving you really short, like gruff responses, basically a syllable of like, huh, uh, like that. And that would be all you get. Or at the end of a long shift, he'd be the first one to say, how you doing kiddo? How you doing? Their oldest daughter, Lori, was the big waitress extraordinaire. She was a lifer, it's what she did. And she got all the best tables, fine. Uh, Rich was their son. He was the cook and his wife was the, the sous chef essentially. 
So that dynamic was completely different. But I learned that all of it was so connected. Everybody very connected to each other. If a dishwasher didn't show up, guess who was washing dishes? <laughs> the lowest waitress on the totem pole. Um, or a bus girl didn't show up and we were busing her on tables. So you have to do a lot of that, right? And I think of it as when I got myself into college, I was like, okay, I'm here. I'm waiting tables again in college, but I'm going to graduate. And everybody said to me, aren't you really excited about getting out there and getting your career started? And I said, you know what? I just can't wait until I don't have to be a waitress anymore. Cannot wait. But guess what? I am still a waitress every day. <laughs> In retrospect, that's truly how I think of a lot of the things that we do within an agency is I'm the waitress. I'm also very much the bartender. So if we really think about how we, ex how we, how we grow in our careers as a manager, all of a sudden I have to think about those who, again, I am serving from a different position. I'm not just serving the client. I'm always gonna be serving the people that work under me or report to me. And that might be in the, in the form of a drink, I have bought a few of those on a tough day. Um, I'm certainly the person to pour drinks when we have a celebration and I'm the person to push, you know, the, the tissue box across the desk or to also be that sounding board, to be the sounding board and to have people sit there and, and just work through their challenges and be that, that support system. I also now get to be the chef and the nice thing about that is as we are thinking about innovating, as we are thinking about new creations, new capabilities, what do we want to focus on, the dream state, that's when I get to be the chef. And that's pretty awesome to me. I have a really good time just imagining the what ifs, the possibilities when a client comes to us and says, we've got this profound challenge that we are having a really hard time kind of stitching together what the next step should be or what we should be doing with our product set, we can come up with great solutions. And that's how I feel like I get kind of my Michelin stars, right? So as we think about the, the business of service and we move into what agencies are like, I go back to that Clearview Supper Club. I go back to that place where I really feel like there is this fight, familial dynamic. We win and lose together. That is very much a key part of like how I think about the agencies, our highs and lows, and everything in between are all related. And we have to all be able to wear a lot of different hats. I mean, that without a doubt is something that I very much encourage. It doesn't mean that you have to start here to get here, but I think that you have to be willing to kind of roll up your sleeves a little bit and be that dishwasher or you know that, that bus girl once in a while. That's just the fact of life. And as we talk about kind of the agency um, versus client, and again, I say V, but it's, it, to me, it's like an and or kind of situation, right? You don't have to necessarily pick a side. I think that the, the core foundation of, you know, clients, client side or agency side is all about those dynamics of the, the, the human condition. I mean, we are just people. Um, and I think that as we kind of think about the agency client relationships, I actually think we're going through an amazing kind of renaissance right now from a relationship perspective. I will tell you a couple of years ago, I was in a position kind of hearing things like, you know what, you guys are big, you're expensive, you're slow, and you're not delivering on kind of that inspiration. And what COVID did, um, it really forced us all to rally around crisis. Because I think more than ever before, Clients had to sit there and go, holy crap, my business, my core business is in a completely different state than I imagined it to be. And the agencies were there to actually say, okay, we know you guys are worrying about that. Let us think about solutions on how to deal with crisis that are going to be relative to your brand. And I think that point was pivotal. Again, two years ago, we were in, I think, a very different place. And I think clients had very much the right to be pushing us. I, I don't necessarily wholeheartedly disagree with where we were, but to be able to rally around crisis and to be able to come out on the other side with even more respect for each other than I think we, we had, I think that kind of goes back to the, the humanity component, right? Like 
it also forced us to say, you know what, <laughs> that CMO's got puke, baby puke on her shoulder and I've got dog slobber on mine. So we're kind of the same, right? Like it really gave us kind of a bear hug um, moment. And that's really exciting to me. Um, so in terms of kind of how that has kind of manifested itself, I think that for our own organization under Dentsu, it's meant that we can't be big, slow, and, and, and overly expensive. We have to think about ways to simplify our value proposition so that clients who are dealing with incredibly complex challenges, that they're not getting something incredibly complex from their agencies. And I think that that is really what's driven us to go from 106 brands, by the way, that's what Dentsu was last year, to seven. And that is in order for us to, I mean, how do you wrangle 106 brands to make sure that they're all talking about the same thing coming from the same pulpit? Um, and how do we control that? We have to be able to simplify that. Even though we are in the business of focusing on some very complex technology, data solutions, media challenges, PR, all of those things culminate under the Denso umbrella. But the reality is, is that we're focused on simplifying so that it's easier for our customers to actually buy. Our clients are asking for that. So what I'll leave you with is, I think it's an amazing time to be in marketing. The relationship renaissance is part of that. I think that's crucial. I think that our clients are so knowledgeable now when it comes to the digital space more than ever before. So we have that opportunity to really yin and yang against each other and I think a really positive, momentous way. I think that as we're thinking about people who we are bringing on board, I think there's a very big shift in terms of how we're hiring and who we're hiring. One, we are hiring at an, an extraordinary pace. So all of you should feel really good coming out of this program very soon because honestly, it is your market. Um, clients are hiring people, we're hiring people. Um, you know, I can't tell you how many recs we have open right now. I mean, literally that's what's going on, but I will tell you the kind of people that we're hiring are not the same anymore. Actually, the executive creative director that I brought on in December is not a native designer or copywriter. And keep in mind, I, I lead performance creative. She is a strategist, true and true customer and media strategist. And frankly, my head of creative strategy is an analyst. So you really have to think about how to apply your skills, regardless of where your focus area has been, to applying it to creative problem solving, because that's what we're asking for. And I don't think strategy is um, a, an area where I think a lot of folks have normally seen themselves like, oh, creative is creative. It's this one thing. It's not. It's strategic. And if you're kind of coming at it from that perspective of strategy, you're going to win the day. Um, you're going to win the week and the year and hopefully really um, earn yourselves positions that are much broader than where you thought they could have been. So that's my perspective on today. Um, I think, again, it is an amazing time to be in marketing. I think you've probably heard plenty from me, and I think I've got such an esteemed panel group um, to be joined with tonight that I think we're going to kind of roll into it. Sound good? Okay. Awesome. Thank you, Amy. So students, prepare your questions because we definitely want to hear from all of you. Um, I'm going to start us off. Actually, I want to dovetail off of, is this, okay. Can I give this to you guys to hand back and forth? That would be great. I want to dovetail off of something Amy mentioned. Um, it's a great time to be in marketing. And I know many of us are going to be in the job market, right? You guys are graduating soon. I'm seeing scary, scary faces. Don't have to be scared. Well, maybe a little scared, but it's a great time to be in marketing. And I want to ask the panel to talk maybe a little bit more about what you all look for when you are interviewing um, people for your positions. I know I've talked with many of you and it sounds like it's a great time in all of your companies, you're all hiring. Um, what are some 
some tips or some things you could maybe share with our students as they're going in thinking about career growth. Um, some of our students will be looking for kind of their first big job. Some of them will be looking to advance um, in their careers. Anything, maybe Steve, do you want to start? Since I have the microphone. <laughs> Hello? Yeah, good. Um, I do a lot of interviewing. Uh, and just to set context on my background. Uh, I spent uh, eight or nine years in brand management at PepsiCo in the Gatorade business, and then four years at Google in a sales role. That's where I, Dave and I met. And then the last four years, I've been CMO at Guaranteed Rate. And we actually have um, an in-house creative agency. So we have very much kind of a hire versus contract, build versus buy mentality and philosophy and always, always have been. So I mention all that only because I, I find myself in the position of hiring uh, a vast diversity of people, you know, from photographers, videographers, writers, designers, uh, MarTech, PR, you know, kind of every, literally every facet of marketing that is very typically uh, held outside of, of the company in agencies uh, inside the company, right? So, um, that makes for an interesting um, prep process because no interview is like the previous, right? Um, but I like to pay attention to a few different things. So, you know, just kind of the tell me about yourself small talk as you're transitioning from the weather, the bears, or, you know, COVID into like, you know, the actual meat of the conversation. Sometimes people feel like that's still um, a safe zone, if you will. Uh, and it is, right? Like, I, I like to you know, kind of maintain a, you know, casual conversational tone in, in interviews, but that's, don't overlook that question. Like that's, that's a big question, right? You need to have a really good answer for, you know, kind of the overview. Tell me about yourself. What have you been up to the last few years? Um, I also like to drill into one or two very specific examples and spend a lot of time there kind of going all the way down into what did, what was the goal? What was the objective? What did you do? What was the impact? And get a sense for the person and kind of the impact that they've had on their business or their client's business through a specific example or two versus kind of talking in generalities, right? Because in the end, when you're, you know, performing at a company or an agency or wherever you are, you're measured on what you're delivering day to day, week to week, not what are the four resume bullet points that you have at the end of your, you know, three or three to five year tenure at that company. Um, and then finally, I would say um, an area that I think a lot of candidates feel like is a throwaway uh, time that they don't prepare for is what questions do you have for me? Um, you know, I can't tell you how often I get the, Oh, I don't have any, or, Oh, I think I already asked them of, you know, your, your colleagues that I, I already interviewed with. Okay, you know, that's, that's leaving an impression too. Like, I, I just spent a lot of time preparing for our conversation so I could ask you good questions. It kind of tells me that you didn't, you didn't do the same. So that just a few tidbits, you know, as I kind of think about interviewing. I, I 100% agree. And particularly on that last one, I would say for me, I'm Karna, I work at Ford, and I have been there for about four months. And I run US marketing. Um, and what's interesting is I came at a time that we're transforming the entire company. So similarly, I interview a lot. And we are um, really trying to change who we are as an organization. And that also means bringing in diverse um, candidates into the organization, and not only diversity through the lens of, you know, kind of classic DEI, but also so diversity in terms of experience and thought and the way that they're going to bring value into the evolution we have to drive. So there are probably four things that I would say. One of them is the curiosity, the point that, that you were making. Are you asking thoughtful questions and being curious um, as we're having the dialogue? Another is passion. Are you passionate about the stories you're telling, the things that you're bringing to the opportunity and passionate about the role? Are you gonna bring an energy with you? And is that energy going to help build momentum around, with the teams around you? A third really important thing for me is also 
um, fit. And I don't mean fit through the lens of just the kind of basic, will they fit here, but rather what are you bringing to the culture and what I call the community of the organization? How are you contributing to make the company a great place to be and a place that you want to be and want to bring other people to? And then last and importantly for me that I would say is really, really critical is whether or not you are bringing your full self to the interview. And am I seeing an authentic you through the, through the, through the process? That's obviously in addition to just your general capability of whatever we're interviewing for, obviously. <laughs> you nailed that. I don't know, are we gonna do that so maybe, Do you wanna share, Lisa? Yeah. No, I was gonna throw this gonna down that way. Uh, she said all the things I would say. Dave uh, from Google, I'm certainly going to add um, or just add on to passion for sure. When you're talking with uh, an interviewee, a candidate, you can tell if they're truly in it or not. And so therefore, for you all, make sure you are going for something that you're really passionate about. You have a lot of ideas and you can just talk for hours about. And that is a really, I think, important part to bring to any company as well. I look for how do you build relationships? You're going to be a part of a team. There's nowhere on any of our teams where you're a pure individual contributor and you can go and do your job and kind of turn it in. You have to be part of a team. And therefore, how do you go make new relationships? How do you develop uh, those relationships? How do you develop client relationships? Because ultimately agency or client, we have to work with other folks, other departments and being able to relate and do even the small stories in the beginning that can break down into that wonderful relationship is really, really important. My two ads. Thank you, that's great. Um, and I think all of you guys have a lot of experience asking questions at this point, right? At least the ones who have been in my class, you guys are good at that. So that's something you, don't, you wanna think about going into those interviews. I totally agree. I, I think whenever I interview someone and I ask that, at the end, do you have any questions for me? And they say, no, it's, it's sort of a red flag. It's like, well, you just covered so much. And, you know, it's such a complex organization. You'd think there would be some questions. So that's a really good one. Any questions at all from the students? I've got a couple others if you guys don't have questions, but I want to throw it out there. Tim? In a minute or so. so okay. We're fine I see you're, you're, you're jotting it down. I get that. Okay. Anyone else? Questions? Yes. Let me repeat the question. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, great question. So the question is, how did you decide whether to go to the brand side or the agency side and sort of what are the pros and cons of both? Perfect question for this group. Lisa? Decide? Do you think you get to decide? <laughs> Life will take you there. Um, I... Uh, I, I started on the agency side and then I went to the brand side and then I came back to the agency side and I took a little break for a moment to convince myself that I should also be an entrepreneur. So I guess my own brand side, if you will. Um, and I, I really, I think that you have to be pretty thoughtful about your, your first step into career. Um, but don't overthink it, I guess. You know, be passionate about it, be curious about it, find something that's interesting, find something that's a really good cultural fit for you versus getting really hung up on, should it be an agency or a client um, or a brand side? Because frankly, we're all marketers. So like at the very essence of it, and Amy said this really well, you know, we're all marketers and we're all working in behalf of building brands and building meaning for those brands and a creative you know, value for the organizations that we are all working for and serve. And so I just look at our team as an extension of a brand's marketing team. Uh, so, so you will just have different experiences. So instead of working through one challenge on one brand, maybe you know, in more depth, you're working across multiple challenges, across multiple brands and having to multitask or switch your brain uh, between brands, maybe from day to day or month to month or year to year. So I, I'd say there's advantages in both. And I actually think it's a really nice thing to flip flop um, and, and try those different experiences. 
Although I might be the only flip flopper. No, you're a flip flopper. I love it. Um, are you a flip flopper too? Nice. So uh, I don't know. Anyone else want to add to the, the flip flopping or, or maybe the other side of it? Where Amy is. You want to go? No, no, okay. If you had a thought. Well, I, I think for me, it was Melrose Place. <laughs> like that, that was literally, and now you guys all got to go watch that. Uh, but Melrose Place. <laughs> you're gonna have to you guys have to watch it that's how i picked agency side it was all about the lifestyle and so i thought it was the lifestyle it was such a big lie but <laughs> but that it was it was just kind of that action um i obviously you guys heard me talk a lot about the restaurant and that kind of like frenetic energy that's what I wanted. And that's what I was hoping I got out of an agency. And, and I, I feel like I kind of got a lot of that. At some point, I might get too tired to keep doing that. But that's where I am right now. I'll certainly say maybe not a flip flopper, but I've worked at an agency. I was a longtime digital brand marketer before that. And, and now at Google helping many of our agency partners. Uh, I, I do think at the agency side of the house, you, you are stretched, you, you are pushed, everyone is pitching in. And therefore, you, you get to learn whether you asked to learn it or not, you are learning all kinds of things that then you can apply uh, in, in many other, hopefully, experiences. On the brand side, you do, you do go deeper. But you also are trying to stretch yourself and uh, hopefully build other things. I mean, I worked on this company, sure, and Tribune and many other uh, <clears throat> marketing companies here in Chicago. And it's still fun. You just might not have that frenetic pace that an agency instantly gives you. And if you can keep that you know, pace up, you can really learn a lot in a short amount of time and then go to the brand side and then come back and just continue to grow your career. Uh, but, but I do think there, there is a lot of great learning when you're stretched really, really thin. Do you have anything or, or not from the, the brand side, the nice, calm? Yeah, yeah so calm. Side. This has been an interesting uh, perception that we have <laughs> of brand life. Easy one. Yeah. So I'll say just a couple of things. Um, I actually come out of college, I was interviewing at strategy consulting firms and ad agencies, and I just didn't get an offer from any of the ad agencies, right? So I, I ended up going the other path because they didn't, they wouldn't have me. Um, but I, but I think that was actually the right path. Because um, if I weren't a, a marketer, I, I don't think I would be you know, an artist or, uh, you know, kind of in the creative field, I think I would probably be in finance or in sales, you know, like I'm, I'm, a, I'm a business guy, right? And I think in agencies, um, I've worked with both, right? I've, I've worked with folks on the creative side that would be, if they weren't at an ad agency, they would be in some very kind of pure creative field, or they would be in some entrepreneurial business field that kind of draws on creativity. I think it's great to have a balance of both on the team that's kind of working for you, um, as long as they can kind of maintain the focus on the goal, which is to, to make money. These are for profit enterprises that are looking to make money, regardless of how beautiful or not that the ad is right. Um, but I, I then kind of grew up in the in the marketing side on the on the brand side and found myself in a um, in the role that I am today as as chief marketing officer at guaranteed rate where we happen to have an agency internal of about 35 strong. So I kind of, um, today is actually a very typical day where I played a uh, client and uh, for about an hour. And then about 20 minutes later, I played kind of agency pitch lead as we were having a conversation with our CEO, right? So I'm, I'm kind of uh, at the same time in, in both roles at, in, in the end. Um, so a little bit of a non-traditional, I think, path, just given the, the fact that we have an agency inside of our business. So pros and cons to the, the, the calm, easy perception of the brand side might not quite be quite as calm and, and, and easy as we think it is. Um, great question. So I, I was thinking about another question that we received actually ahead of time from one of our students. What about students who are thinking about maybe 
something a little bit different, like nonprofit or, or higher education, maybe something a little bit um, outside of, of you know, the, the current roles that you all are in, but you probably have some experiences with. How do the skill sets that you've built throughout your careers translate to some So I, I've obviously never worked for a nonprofit, but I've been on boards of nonprofits and, and worked with nonprofits in a number of different capacities. And at the end of the day, there, there are a lot of similarities because they are still trying to operate their organization like a business to achieve what their business objectives are, right? Their objectives are often, you know, more altruistic than our capitalistic uh corporate jobs that, that all of us have, but at its core, you're trying to understand the needs of a customer and figure out how to fulfill on those needs in the most effective way possible. And you are also still trying to make money. You're just you typically trying to make that money to raise money to be able to fund all the things that I just described. So I think the same skill sets will hold true. Um, I, I have a lot of colleagues who have gone from the client side into non for, nonprofit um, and took a lot of their marketing skills from big corporations and shifted them into doing marketing. And then subsequently, one of them um, was at Coke and then went to American um, Cancer Society and went from uh, marketing into actually being, uh, I don't think she was the CEO, but maybe the COO of, of the organization. So you can see kind of how those skills transfer, regardless of the fact that they are not necessarily for-profit organizations. Um, also haven't worked for a nonprofit, but I'm on the board of, of one particularly. And I, I do think sometimes there is a lack of sophistication, frankly, within the, the concept of marketing. There's a lot of great fundraising, a lot of great grant writing, but oftentimes I think non-for-profits um, don't, it's almost like marketing is like dirty, like, ooh, we're like, we're gonna like do CRM. We're gonna like email these people, you know, instead of like having someone fancy go out and try to hustle money out of them. Like that's less dirty, I'm not sure. But the idea that you could actually market on behalf of, you know, a non for profit and in a very, you know, whatever it is, you know, that you're endeavoring to do to make the world better. I do think that there is a lack, a lack of sophistication. So if you can get into that world and really up level the capability I mean, kudos because you would be doing, you know, the world a great service. Anyone? Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's just one thing that I'll add to that. I don't really need a mic very often. Um, <laughs> yeah, for them, for them, yes. Uh, so I think that as you as you think about other areas like leaving an agency to go and venture, I think one of the things that you know, going off of kind of that sophistication component, I think one thing that agencies do really well is um, kind of offer a level of storytelling that I think that oftentimes gets completely missed on those other sides. And, and, and it's, it's really that weaving of a story that is, you know, strategic. It, you know, kind of captures someone's imagination so that at the end of the day, they can make a case for what they need. Um, you know, we're, in, in all of those cases, we, we do a ton of work with, with nonprofits. Um, you know, I've also been on more of the entrepreneurial side. You're always looking for funding. And I think if you can't tell a really good story to someone sitting across from you, to like, why? Why should this matter? And why should I get the funding? Whether or not that's a, a big donor um, or, you know, someone who you're looking to give you capital. I think that those are really important skill sets that agencies do really well that carry over really nicely into kind of that set. Definitely. And I think what you said, Lisa, really resonated with me too, that the sophistication sometimes is, is just lacking and the structure of, you know, building campaigns, allocating budget, establishing goals and, and investing in software, building creative campaigns. You know, some of the things that we take for granted in the IMC program and, and in all of our businesses are not always there for nonprofits because they don't have the resources or they don't have the, the sophistication. So we can bring those pieces in. Sometimes that can be really, um, really well regarded and, and needed. Yeah, cheap trick, uh, just get an agency to do the work for photo. Right, Because right. we do it all the time. Yeah. <laughs>
Yeah, and hmm. use Google Grants as well, right, Dave? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So just put you yeah, back in. Beyond uh, the marketing communications of it, 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 it is the brief where many agencies and internal marketing teams spend a lot of time on, but being pithy, being able to tell your story, as Amy said, or that's important regardless of what area you go into, client side, agency side, nonprofit, higher ed, telling your story, telling your brand story in a way that gets someone, certainly in the nonprofit side, to devote time, capital, resources, funding, all of that, but it, time. Why should I go sign up for this nonprofit? Because I believe in it. Why? There's a story here. And it all kind of gets back to that creative brief that sometimes gets skipped because they, they aren't uh, maybe not as sophisticated or they don't feel that they have the right to have that type of engagement. And again, as Lisa said, many agencies are dying to build out their pro bono work and would do a lot of this stuff. So for free. So one of the questions we got ahead of time was about how agencies and clients can become allies and, and kind of agencies can help clients secure investment in marketing, you know, be innovative, sort of do some of the things that are hard to get buy-in for maybe on the client side. And since you work with a lot of agencies, I thought that might be a, a good question for you. Yeah, I, I, certainly I think agencies uh, would love to have bottomless pits of media dollars to, to carry out their ideas. But I, I do think the partnership between an agency and a client, the best ones are when everyone knows the true customer business objective, what, what that true metric is. Because I've seen many times agencies who are either executing creative or executing media and they're they're handed the role and they're just kind of performing, but they're not brought in for the higher level strategy conversations. They're not in a uh, trusted advisor. I know it's a phrase and we'll probably throw out a couple more of these phrases that, that they have with the client where they can challenge, well, why are you asking to do this? Or why is that a goal? Have we tried this? Or we've seen as an agency you know, we'll bring a, a story or a success story from a completely different vertical. Maybe we should try it this way. And having that trust with the client to go, huh, no, no, I want you to keep on doing the exact same thing that I've been doing for 10 years. It's worked. Don't challenge it. I don't think any of us within the marketing sphere want that. And when you have a great collaboration and I'll throw in Google or Amazon, Twitter, Facebook, whoever, to, to come together with the agency, with the client to pull a, a great campaign together, it, all kinds of things happen that people are very happy about. But it really does start with that trusted relationship and understanding ultimately what that brand is trying to do or that campaign beyond, I think, execution which we have to, I, I think many of our agencies have to leave the execution aside and try to go to higher value insights, storytelling, and I think bringing in much more creative sensibilities back to both the media side, but certainly uh, overall creativity, uh, which is probably why many of you are interested in this and probably why many of us came to this space. Agencies can be allies and kind of, you know, foster those relationships. Yeah. I think for me, um, one of the best agency client relationships is when the agency is like my business partner, not just the group that goes and, and, and does the work that um, I need to get done. And so that's more than just thinking strategically. That's actually being in the trenches and understanding what the business objective is. And importantly, you, you talked about it through the lens of funding. I had, in my last two roles, I've had massive budgets, but yet I spend 
probably 50% of my time in both of these roles, justifying those budgets and or re-getting permission to spend those budgets. The agency is my critical partner in hand, like road dog to help me build those stories and help my teams build those cases to justify what's the return we're gonna get? How long is that gonna take? How's it gonna drive business value? Those types of things. And I think that the agencies that can't do that as well um, are the ones that tend to have some of the shorter stints or are brought in for, for finite things as opposed to having some of those more longevity relationships. Steve, did you have anything to add to that from the client perspective? You, you kind of have both because you've got the internal agency as well. Yeah, I would just say data and research, right? I mean, it's when you're talking about agencies or media agencies and creative agencies, and they both need data and research to, su to support what they're doing, right? Um, because in the end, money spent on media needs to deliver money back to the business, right? Um, and creative storytelling can be subjective in terms of how to how best to bring that story to life, this song versus another, or this actor and an actress versus another. Um, and so having research and data to, to back up those decisions and support those decisions is, is hugely important. One, one thing I think that, um, that I'll just I'll add to it is on the, on the research side, it's obvious, right, that on the, on the media side, the closer you get to a click or, or kind of in the digital world, the easier it is to measure. Um, the further away you get from a click, the harder it is when you think about things like TV or PR or, or billboards, right? Um, I think it's a huge opportunity. I'm, I'm actually somewhat shocked and disappointed that there haven't been more advancements on the research and measurement side of sort of traditional non-digital media. And so I think that's just a macro opportunity um, because it's a problem I remember hearing about 20 years ago, and I'm not sure we've advanced all that much since then. Um, digital is a totally different story, right? But on the traditional side, um, I think that opportunity still exists. I'll just repeat the question, make sure Zoom folks can hear. Sure. So okay. the question was, um, how often on the agency side do you have to work on a campaign or with their purpose? So we're uber mindful of this in the agency world. And in fact, in my current role, um, I drive growth for our agency across North America. Um, and we get a lot of inbound opportunities being a global agency. And one of the very first things that I do is ensure that the brand aligns with our global purpose. And that's making a meaningful difference to brands, businesses, and people. And just last week, I turned down to relationships, prospective relationships, because they didn't align with our purpose. So sort of there is often now, it may be less so in the past, a, a real filter on how does the brands that we're going to engage with align with what we believe is important to what we want to build in the world and what we want and we believe that our talent wants to build in the world. So it is top of mind. Um, and then there's things that are sort of you know, gray areas that some people would love to work on and other people might not, uh, like cannabis, for example, or, or some other sort of leading edge vice uh, sort of opportunities like alcohol or spirits or something. And that's when you really know your talent and, and you make sure that you're crafting the teams that build the right chemistry with the right clients. Um, and we take a lot of time and effort in, in crafting um, those teams. And, and we ask our, our our, our talent, what they want to work on, what they're excited to work on, and people often raise their hands. So um, I, I don't know if this still exists in the world anymore, that people are forced to work on business that they don't want to. I, uh, that's not our experience. Um, I'm sure it's not Amy's, it doesn't look like. 
Um, so hopefully that doesn't happen to you. And you know what, then there's a lot of places to work in the world. There's a lot of opportunity. And right now more than ever, uh, you know, the, our talent has the opportunity to kind of drive the, the you're the buyers in the market right now. <laughs> That's good news. Add to that. I no, I mean, I, I think it's the same, right? Like we, we have had instances and I would say um, in my prior agency, we, we had a particular um, client that we literally, it was, it was not necessarily, it was kind of that time in, in place where things were just starting to become a little bit more heads up in terms of uh, aligning um, kind of a agency what we wanted to be representative from an agency perspective and the clients. We were kind of just in this mental state of like, we just need more clients, right? Like that, that was a thing. And I think at that point, um, you know, we had a lot of people who were like, I'm not working on that business. And that was their choice. Um, it, no one's going to force you to be like, you have to work on this or, you know, else. And I think now what I really appreciate is, is where I'm at being that we do have very similar to what Lisa said, we kind of, we, we vet all of those things for what does that look like, you know, for our people, are our people going to be proud to represent that brand? And, you know, I think that that's where you as an agency have to make those calls. But again, you guys are the kind of the, the future and the, the buyers of, you know, the, the employment. So. I'm just curious, have you ever had a, an instance where you were working with a client and it was going fine and then it all of a sudden wasn't anymore and, and been in a situation where, where things changed and you had to disengage or make a big change in your agency. I know that's that's happened to me before. I'm just wondering if that's ever happened because of purpose or because of fit or any of these things. I don't know about fit being as, I mean, it to me what happens is the, the people fit is usually the first thing to go, right? Like that's, that's why there is kind of, you know, the, the level of turnovers that you see at, at agencies. Um, and, and I think that it's because of a people fit more than anything, or the fact that, you know, something, some team is not upskilled or, and I think that you have to get ahead of those things in order to, to salvage a relationship. Sometimes they're not salvageable. Um, unfortunately, and it's, it's a parting of the ways, um, you know, we had a client um, not that long ago where it was truly that their, their vision for what they were trying to do and how we were trying to get them there did not match. And as the, the leaders of that particular account, it was decided that we all should part ways. It just wasn't going to go any, it wasn't going to get any better. Um, but it was, you know, personalities are a huge thing. Um, whether or not you're on the client side or the agency side and just being able to kind of look at that perspective and be real about it, I think is really critical. I think another thing that can drive the need for that type of change is when the client changes, like literally inside of the client. So I mentioned to you guys right now at Ford, we're going through a major transformation. I joined the company four months ago. So U.S. has a new leader from a marketing perspective. My boss joined the company, Susie Deering, who's the global chief marketing officer, um, let's call it eight months ago, however long ago January was. And so, you know, the one of the first things that happens when you have that type of a changeover is an assessment of not only your team and talent that you have, but also the team and talent that you have at the agency and how set they are to deliver whatever you're trying to drive. That becomes even more important when you're dry, trying to drive a transformation because you're typically looking for your agency, not just to do the work, but to push you as a client and drive more than you would have been able to do on your own, which means that you have to have the right team and talent at the agency to be able to think towards the future, drive different thinking, challenge status quo, especially when you're dealing with an organization like ours at Ford, which is amazing people with very long Ford careers and very long Ford tenures, amazing people, but they've, most of them have seen the world through one lens. And so if our agency has also kind of only operated in that lens, then we need a changeover, not necessarily of the agency, but of the team and the talent to help guide us towards that future destination. 
And that's why we all want clients like her. <laughs> <laughs> right? Well, I didn't meet the brand. I meant that. Aww. Yes. Aww. Like that pushing and that respecting the pushing right. is when you show up and do your best work. Absolutely. That's what I was going to say when Dave mentioned the idea of the trusted advisor, which I think we all aspire to build those types of relationships, but they're evasive, right? It's, it's not an easy thing to say, I trust my agency enough that I'm going to ask them to push me as a, as a, as an individual, as a creative, as a company, that's a really, that's a really tough thing. Well, it's also, you know, classic that the senior person says, yes, push us and challenge us. But then the team underneath us just wants to make sure that they're doing what they think that their boss wants them to do. So they're not going to let the agency push and challenge. So it's also important that you create the culture and the environment to encourage the push and the challenge all the way through the organization. Otherwise, you still end up in the same place. <laughs> We have plenty of work to do. <laughs> okay, well, we've got a question from one of our, um, our Zoom attendees. And that question is, um, let's talk a little bit about the pros and cons of having an agency in-house at a brand. Um, are there specific types of brands that would benefit more from having an in-house agency than others? Sure, so I would say, um, I changed my perspective on that over the last few years. Um, when I started at Guaranteed Rate, I fully expected to come in and, you know, take a hard look at this in-house agency model and potentially go out to the outside, right? And after a couple months, I decided that for that business at this time, that was not the right decision. Um, and the reason why is as a sort of mid-sized, trending, large company, privately held, that is very dependent upon the macro and micro economy. Um, you know, this week, the, the product were, you know, the, 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 the most poignant opportunity might be a refinance. Two weeks from now, the Fed could change gears and we could be, we could have a totally different focus, right? And so the opportunity to, very literally walk 14 steps to my chief creative officer who used to lead a big creative team at Leo Burnett and have a whiteboarding session 20 minutes later is in stark contrast to my experience at Gatorade where I sat in the loop here in Chicago. We had a super fancy agency based in LA. We would say, hey, let's meet first thing in the morning tomorrow and that meant for them about 1030 Pacific time, right? And, and then, you know, four months later, we'd have like an awesome TV spot on the air. And, and I'm not knocking the work. The work was always awesome, right? But it would always take four months, right? And, and, and in, in this business, in this industry, with our type of business, that is, that is not okay, right? And, and so I think it really, really depends on where you are, how dependent you are on advertising to drive your business, um, and you know how dynamic that environment can change week to week, month to month, versus is it kind of pretty pretty steady? So speed and, and agility, I'm hearing. Uh, cost. <laughs> also really important, but I think, so I've been in multiple companies that have either created or had in-house agencies, and I've seen some succeed better than others, both on the media agency side and the creative agency side. One of the things that I will say is you have to have an environment, and particularly as it relates to creative, you have to have an environment and a culture that allows that, creatives, that creative team's creativity to thrive. If you take a kind of a classic, stodgy corporate culture, but then expect that you're going to get edgy, fantastic, um, out of the box creative thinking, but you want them to operate in that other cultural style, then you're probably not putting them in the situation that's going to get bring the best out of them. So then when you're constantly complaining that you're not getting great thinking, it's probably less about whether they're capable and more about how are you enabling them to do it. I think the other thing has been um, the instances that I've seen at work really great is when you need things quick and um, you need it in high volume. So performance marketing, whether it's uh, assets, 
like the creative assets or whether it's the copy um, or even the media turn that needs to go with it works really well as an in-house capability. And frankly, I think works the best as an in-house capability because to your point, you can react to the marketplace a lot faster um, and the dynamics are just very different. However, in instances where we've, you know, tried to have the agency do kind of the master campaign, I've had mixed experiences. In some instances, it's just completely flopped multiple times. In other instances, you've got a couple of um, home runs, but it's much more challenging to find those big, iconic brand building things from an in-house agency, um, but not impossible. I think the there's less variety for sure because you're working on one brand and one business, right? I mean, I think that's probably obvious, but um, you then also have the luxury of you know getting to know that brand and that business more deeply, probably and really well than than you might otherwise because you're interacting not just with one or two or 10 clients, but you have the opportunity to interact with, you know, that are all, by the way, in marketing, right? Most, most often, but you have the opportunity to kind of connect with salespeople and operations people and, you know, really kind of go deep on the different nuances of the business. So I think it's um, likely a trade-off between sort of depth and variety. Yeah. And from the media perspective, it's, it's tricky, right? Um, I think if you're a very large organization, there's absolutely some sense in bringing a lot in house uh, because you will have Googles and other friends coming and knocking on your door for your dollars and keeping you really in the know and including you in alpha and beta opportunities and keeping your staff trained and up to date. But if you're a smaller organization and you're trying to do some of that stuff in house, it can be tricky and it can also be tricky to keep talent because you know they want to keep growing and learning and there does sometimes become a ceiling on that headroom issue. So I think depending also on the vertical. So we see tons of D to C marketers who've got extraordinary capability in-house as it relates to performance analytics measurement. And then we can work really closely with them on helping build and build that funnel for them from the top. And then they can take it with all their capability in-house, their data, and like just close the sale. Um, but I, I definitely think it depends on the size of the organization, the vertical that it's in. Um, and, and often, and here's another thing, and maybe it doesn't matter anymore in this day and age, but where the, 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 where the company is based. So some great talent just doesn't want to live in some places. You know, um, I have a client who the only reason they don't do more in-house is because no one wants to live in the city that they're in. <laughs> so, um, you know, that also has a bearing on, I think, if it's successful or not. Yeah, the in-house agency probably doesn't have locations all over the Caribbean and uh, the country, right? <laughs> in-house agencies here in Chicago. Any questions, students? Yes. Oh, okay. I'm actually not a student. Oh, that's so, okay. Um, Your question is still good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so um, I graduated in December 2020, and right now I'm working um, um, in-house with IAM, but I'm looking for opportunities with agencies, and I've had a few interviews. So for my um, uh, agency people, what are some of the qualities that you would say are most valuable that um, like in-house people have? What do you expect um, in-house people best? Or say you have that moment where you go, um, hey, you work in-house, you should know this and this and this. Um, so what are some of the key competitiveness when it comes to um, someone with an in-house experience? So the question is for in-house agencies, are there additional sort of qualities that you're looking for or competitive advantage opportunities? Oh, I meant for, um, I guess it's very for all agencies. Yeah, for agencies. So if you're if you're looking for an agency type of role, yeah. What types so like of for someone who's quality? transitioning. Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, for someone who's transitioning from in house to agency. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. What are some of the uh, edge advantage? 
So if you're transitioning from in house to agency, got it. Oh, I've got it. Oh, oh, okay, great. I just got stuck with the mic. So I'll, I'll start this one. I don't think it's very, any different than the first question we answered, frankly. I, I honestly, all transferable skills at the end of the day, we're looking for kind, curious, passionate, um, interested uh, talent. And if you're having trouble getting recognized, like work on the SEO on your resume, because uh, that's one thing. Uh, be really resilient and poke people at the company. I have all sorts of folks across all of the different types of disciplines that we have within Havas um, reach out to me directly on LinkedIn. And I am happy always to answer those LinkedIn messages and pass those resumes on to recruiters, whether they're alum or not. You know, like I, I absolutely believe that that tenacity and that spirit of, of raising your hand and asking should be rewarded with passing your information along. Um, so just put yourself out there, I guess, is the best way to go about that. Um, because at the end of the day, like the knowledge that you have is going to absolutely translate. And by the way, we love training people. So don't worry about it. If you don't have the skill, we're happy to train you on it. So I think that's a really great point. You know, coming out of the IMC program, these students are probably going to be a little bit overwhelmed almost with how much knowledge you've just obtained over the last year and a half or so. Um, but you don't, I, I say this a lot in my class, you don't have to be everything to everyone. You don't have to pretend that you're interested in something that maybe you're not interested in because, you know, these companies are all hiring. They're looking for people who are passionate and curious and, you know, have skills, of course, um, but also, you know, some of those softer things that we're talking about, I think are really important as well. So, I think, you know, it's a good reminder that it's not just, you know, all the buzzwords and the jargon and, you know, all of those pieces, but, but there are a lot of other things that, that these guys are looking for as well. I'll, I'll just add uh, in many of the conversations that I've had with the leases of the world uh, on agency side, there's a ton of openings at agencies, a ton. And if you know programmatic, if you know DV, if you can do data and analytics, you'll get a job because there's again. Yeah, I, have a job that I, say. I mean, a, <laughs> hundreds of job openings right now. There are hundreds open, okay. and we we get approached a lot where people are asking for even more help on account servicing and what have you. And yes, we're hiring. Facebook's hiring. Twitter's hiring. Amazon's hiring. We hire from agencies, agencies hate that. I get a lot of calls because of that. But there's, uh, again, back to finding what you're passionate about, figuring out where you wanna work, but the jobs are absolutely there. Here in Chicago, in New York, in the Bay Area, many of our friends can't find enough people to hire. So keep up the tenacity and you'll find that job. such as major sponsorships or events. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about the guarantee rate or board and how do you think about those kind of activities? Yes, um, actually I would put events and sponsorships kind of somewhere in between traditional media and very highly measurable media. I find it, you know, e easier oftentimes to measure that. Um, I think it's a mix of art and science in terms of, you know, metrics around impressions and media value and, you know, kind of from any of the, you know, third party providers, along with, um, you know, sort of brand fit, uh, you know, kind of qualitative analysis around, you know, sort of the, the, the quality of the impression, you know, kind of where it sits on the screen, you know, kind of all of those things are kind of taken into account. Um, events specifically in a extraordinarily sales-driven culture, 
that is a referral business, that is a people-based business, is I always preach to our salespeople that is, if I were in your shoes, that is the absolute first dollar I'd spend is in events, right? Because mortgage and loan origination, very similar to real estate uh, brokerage is a very people-oriented referral-based business. And people like doing business with people they know and like and trust, right? So um, events is a no-brainer for me. Um, and then sponsorship is kind of, like I said, a mix of art and science. I think to build on that, a part of it is also that it depends on what your objective of that sponsorship or that event is. So um, kind of to the point that Steve was making, looking at it through the lens of how many leads did it help me generate? Or if my objective, for instance, when I was at Verizon, we did sponsorships a lot. It wasn't because we needed a lot of brand awareness because everybody knows Verizon, but rather it's because you, we would use a lot of our sponsorship rights and assets to actually engage with existing customers and use it as a part of our loyalty program. And so the things that you're measuring are tied to how much they are using, engaging those types of things. So I, I agree that I find sponsorships and and experiential to sometimes be easier to connect down to uh, the business driving value out of them than some things like um, a television sponsorship of a major award show or something like that. That can be a far more challenging um, thing to justify and to measure. And I would just say on, on media partnerships, sponsorships, sports sponsorships, et cetera, um, there is so much ad skipping, ad blocking in the world nowadays that often the best way to get your brand noticed is within the programming, within the content, and that's often through only a partnership or a sponsorship. Um, so it's kind of back to the old school days, right? When it was the Oval Teen Radio Hour or whatever, it's like, it is the advertising is the thing is the sponsorship. So, um, you know, a lot of fickle folks don't wanna watch ads. I'm one of them, um, so or hear them. So when everyone can skip and block, it's sometimes the best way to do it. <laughs> what are the things that you would say to you that would make you get where you are in a faster way without maybe you can tell us some uh, some anecdotes that you can share with us and also what are the how, how is working with your team what are the special uh, positions that you that you think you couldn't live without in your team that you are constantly talking with or collaborating that you think that are is super necessary to have and um, so that we probably consider those kind of positions are the same. Thanks, Julio. So, so the first question, I love this question is or advice or something you remember that someone said to you. Do I have that right, Julio? Something someone said to you that sort of helped you launch your career and your journey. Is that, is that a good summary, Julio, the first question? Yeah, or with something with that they made a mistake that they learned a lot. Or a mistake they, where you learned a lot and, and you remember that yeah. moment. My gosh, I've made so many mistakes. <laughs> And a few years ago, friend was like many, many years ago um, because I was already working before 05 <laughs> when I graduated. I know. So maybe can somebody take this mic for me while I peruse which awful mistake I'll share with you? <laughs> Does somebody have something teed up? Uh, go, you go for it. You have it. So so, oh, come on. You know what? Look at this guy. This guy's really great. Right, yeah. exactly. Amy's always, uh, so it's not necessarily a, a, a mistake, but I, I think if I were able to go back however many years ago and to, to have the learning of I versus we, even uh, as an early manager, there was a lot of I, I, I did this, I, no, I didn't, we did that. And being able to tell the story about we and what your team did and that you disappear, it's about the team, 
would have saved a whole lot of, I think, uh, bad one-on-ones that uh, I used to have. But I, I think just grow as a leader. And it's about supporting your team. Yes, you're playing a part. I play a part still today in leading that team. But the team part, the we part is really, really important. And I, I do think it takes a lot of trial and mistakes just uh, as a manager to, to figure that out. But if I knew that at Sure or Tribune and uh, was less focused on my career and more focused on my team member's career, again, back to the Amy's, we're here in service of each other. And through that, then yeah, your career will get farther and farther up. But if you are only focused on your career, uh, it gets hard pretty quick. Yeah, I would say some some really good advice that I got from my career, um, which was to um, stop being such a reluctant leader. I think I'm very much an introvert. And so I think that quite often I will sit back and just take it all in. And someone actually saw that it seemed like a lot of hesitation and I wasn't really willing to come out of my shell quite as much as I probably should have. Um, they saw that in me. Um, and I think that that commentary around my perceived relux reluctance made me have to rethink kind of how I was presenting myself. And I think that that was a huge uh, change in terms of kind of you know, getting me to that next manager, supervisor, director level. Um, and, and I think that that's a really important lesson is to just not, not be so reluctant and to take, you know, in terms of your tribe, some of that feedback to heart and, and it's what you do with it. That's going to really make the biggest difference. Uh, I would just add that I would say, as I was transitioning a few years ago from sort of a manager of individual contributors to a manager of managers. Um, probably the biggest learning was to take the time to check in frequently and be very clear with everyone about what the vision is and what the mission is and what the big picture is, right? And then drive all the way down to how your role, junior individual contributor person X, right? is very, very important. And what is the role that that plays in the broader missions? Because otherwise there can be a tendency for people to sort of get lost and feel like they're just kind of putting one foot in front of the other on their you know little corner of the business. And they don't have a recognition of how that's important to the broader. And that can result in a number of bad outcomes, right? In terms of, you know, loss of, lack of, uh, or loss of morale, um, turnover, all, all of those things, right? If the, if the role is not important and in service of the mission, then the role shouldn't exist. And, and you as a leader should reorg the, the, the business, right? To ensure that every single role is super important to that, to that higher level uh, goal and mission. I think for me, one thing that has become one of the most powerful things that I do now as a leader and have learned as a leader and wish that I knew a long time ago is how to actually extend my team. So what I mean by that is um, we never have enough team members. We never have enough resources to do what we want to do. And when I was younger in my career in that situation, me and my team, I would kind of drive us through a lens that just had us constantly working a lot, not achieving everything that we could because I didn't, I saw everything through the lens just of the immediate resources and people around me that I was accountable for. What I've learned as a leader as I've matured is the power of the expanded network. And um, I, I actually took a leadership class one time and I cannot think of the name of it, but it's basically um, expansion of force and the way your ability to get other people even beyond your immediate purview on board with your vision and your mission and what you're trying to accomplish. And all of a sudden you can expand the number of people and the amount of resources available to you to achieve something and accomplish something. Inside of my organizations now I do it all the time. I may have a team that only has five people focused on something, but what I'm constantly talking to them about is, 
where else in the organization does this touch and how can you get them excited about it so that they can either give you resources, become a part of the team, whatever the case may be. And all of a sudden five becomes 10, 10 becomes 20. And you can actually accomplish what you need to without everybody breaking in the process. So everyone said really nice things. So I'll just say some very practical things. <laughs> um, learn a PL, please. Uh, learn how a PL is managed, uh, what EBIT means, understand how your organization makes money. Because for the most part, you will be viewed as an expense versus as driving value and growth. So it's super important that you understand how the money is made in the organization and how it's accounted for, um, it's paramount. And by the way, it's also just good for you to know that just generally speaking. Um, I think, you know, don't be an asshole. Like people have very long memories and you can do something that you think is just sort of, I don't know, offhanded or whatever and, and not realize the impact that you're making on other people because you're running really fast. You're trying to get something done or you forgot that you just ran somebody over. But uh, don't be an asshole. It's, you know, people want to work with kind people and they help them and they continue to help them throughout their careers. Cause you're going to find people who are advocates for you throughout your career and they won't be advocates for you if you're an asshole. Um, and then, yeah, going back to the, I thing, it drives me crazy. I, I count the number of eyes and emails. So it's, it's something that is really extraordinary. Um, None of us are doing anything by ourselves in any of the organizations that we're in. There's very few individual contributors. And the more eyes that show up in an email to me, the more um, I, I realize there's a lack of maturity and there's an insecurity that's driving this person's behavior. And it's, it's a teachable moment, actually. So um, those are just less nice things than my colleagues said. That's still very nice. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and then I think the second part was does anyone have something on someone on your team with a skill set that you that really stands out to you? Like, I can't live without this person. This person is just really critical in the success of our team or our organization. I think that's a, a great question for these students to be thinking about. Um, I, I wouldn't say that there's one person, but I do think it kind of goes back to things we all need to know and learn. And that's very important is. Uh, surround yourself with people who are very different than you and have different skill sets that complement your own. Um, I am not organized. I'm the least project management person ever. And the most fabulous person on my team is so organized. And she calls me up three times a day and she's telling me what I need to be remember, like remembering to do. It is amazing. Um, but having those people around you and in your life that you know that you have gaps and you surround yourself with them, um, you'll all help each other do way more. It's sort of like that expansion concept. I 100% agree with that. I am also not the most organized person, even though I started my career in project management. But, you know, we see that's not the, the route that I took over time. Um, the other thing I would say is um, analytics and analytical rigor, critical thinking, um, no matter which direction you're going, I personally find that at least particularly when you're client side, so much of what you're trying to do is build a case and sell a case. Um, to leadership, to other teams within the organization, et cetera. So that ability to analyze data and information um, and translate it into meaningful insights and meaningful action plans, that to me is one of the most critical things that I look for in a lot of, uh, a lot of the talent that I've talked to. Go ahead. You don't have anything? Okay. I think that... I think it's like not having, you want people who are not afraid to be very frank with you. I think that is, I mean, they're the best mirror. I surround myself with, you know, a core four and they come from very different backgrounds. I think they are all smarter than me for one. <laughs> and I think that they are great sounding boards and they are not afraid to sit there and look me straight in the eye and say, that just feels really like the wrong thing. And, you know, I think that that's an important element or dynamic that we as leaders have to be willing to hear and want to hear 
Because if we're not, you know, open to that kind of dialogue within your trusted circle, you're certainly not going to be open to it outside of that, that closed door. Amy took it right out of my mouth, but yeah, apply it to your personal life. You, you want that friend who's going to tell you, hey, don't do that. <laughs> you need someone at work to also go, mm, not a good idea. That sounding board so that you can go, oh, yeah, you're right. That was a dumb idea. I'll try it again in a different way. But yeah, you, you just need that sounding board. And I, I think life would be much better for many of us if we always turned around and said, hey, how about this idea? Okay, no, let's not do that. All right, well, I think we have time for maybe one more question. Yes. Uh, I'm, my name is Brady. I'm a first quarter IMC student. I was curious how IMC students are going to fit into the future of marketing and what that looks like. What should we be expecting? So the question is about the future of marketing and how our IMC students can be working toward that right future that exists for for us in integrated marketing communications. I'll, I'll start with, I think where the last slide of Amy's deck, the, the future is bright. It is, uh, I think, a very innovative space. We can kind of set with the right measurement, uh, of course, which is now much more of a proof point that we need to, to show. But the ecosystem is continuing to change. Privacy, cookies, tracking, all of that is going to be reset in 2023, depending on if you follow what Google says <clears throat> or whoever else. Uh, but because of that, and because of our heightened consumer focus on what we control and what other uh, entities control, what we grew up in of the two decades of digital will be reborn again. So having a deep appreciation for getting into the analytics, understanding data, understanding business and how business works. But back to, I think some of the commentary earlier, how to tell a story, how to get that brief, how to communicate these are all really important things that I think can get even better with uh, what we have in front of us. And I, I don't think any of us have a crystal ball on how the world's going to look, but I know all of you and your careers and your passion to hopefully put the world in a better place than where we are today is really important. So that's my, my story. So I'll, it's a great question, Bree. I'll start by saying there are multiple uh, Medill IMC grads on my team, <laughs> and I've worked with um, several of them actually in each of my last uh, couple of career hops. But as I look at the kind of the category on the wall, media communications, right? It strikes me as one thing that's that's um, that's remaining the same, and that has remained the same since I think the beginning of mankind is storytelling, right? Back to kind of around a campfire, all the way to, you know, what's in your feed today, right? Um, so that, if it's working, right? Oh. Yeah, today, I said today. I didn't say yesterday. Um, so uh, storytelling remains the same, but media is changing at a very, very rapid pace, right? And that'll continue to be the case, right? So I think, um, it's just kind of sort of an interesting inter intersection of storytelling, which I think will always be a thing. And then how that story gets conveyed, which continues to change and is only changing more rapidly. So I think for all those reasons, um, you know, you're equipping yourself with the right tools. I think the one ad I would make is if you keep the single truth of your customer or your consumer, at the core of the way that you make decisions, plan, come up with ideas, et cetera, you'll always be able to move yourself continuously to the forefront of where marketing needs to go. Um, I also think that if you, in doing so, marry the humanity with the digital data technology analytics and don't ever let yourself lose sight of the human being or the group of human beings that are on the other side of what you are solving for, that too will also help you constantly think about 
about things in a way that's going to take you to where you need to go versus getting caught or stuck um, in the ways of the past. So marketing used to be in service of like a great engineer or a really great, you know, financial service that was out there or something akin to that. But more and more, those are a bit commoditized. So brands are sort of at the, the crux of a, a dilemma. We care less about them than ever before, but more about them than ever before, because anybody can make a product really well now. I mean, shoot, you can go order it on Alibaba and market it and brand it however you want. And the thing that actually makes it the thing is the stories that you've built behind it, the, the marketing that you've put around it and the consumer insight you've built into it. So it's really extraordinary time where marketing finally in so many organizations is at the forefront versus in service, I think, to the finance people or the engineers or the product development folks or whomever. So it's pretty exciting. So I'm hearing a lot of really common threads, even though the questions are, are so different. A lot of commonalities are, are shining through the idea of storytelling, the idea of, of, you know, the platform might change, but at the core, it's all about the customer and understanding the customer. These are all IMC concepts, right? Um, Steve, you talked about how important it is to have data and evidence, you know, no matter what it is that you're trying to accomplish, you have to go back to the data and, and Karna, you mentioned that as well. All of these things are fundamentals, right? These are things we talk about in class every day. Um, you even mentioned SEO. Thanks for doing that, Lisa. <laughs> a lot of these students know that's my uh, that's my yeah. Keyword, make right? sure that all the owned media is working as hard as possible before you pay any dollars into marketing. Yes, yes, yes. Right. absolutely. So this has been just absolutely fantastic. First of all, huge thank you to our panelists. students for being here. It is so great to see you all in person and to have a live event back here at 303 East Wacker. Thanks to everybody at uh, Medill and, and 303 East Wacker who helped make this event happen. We are not done. We are just going to kind of move down the hall now and have some refreshments and a little bit of a chance to talk to our panelists. So let's um, go ahead and do that. Thanks, everybody. Right, they throw me under the bus and, and you can have baby. <laughs>